Good morning, everyone. We're reading in Book 2, the book of the Traveler of the Worlds, Canto 7, The Descent into Night. In our reading, we, we read as far as the break on page 208, and then we went back last week and we, we had a closer look at the whole of the first section, and we stopped on page 205 at the break. King Aswapati is exploring the worlds of life. We started with uh, Canto 3, where he saw first an image of life as we know it, contradictory, uh, varied, unreliable. But then Sri told us that this life goddess, this life principle, pure and bright from the timeless, was her birth. Eternal bliss is her native home. And Asvapati was given a glimpse or even quite a comprehensive overview of those griefless worlds. So if the origin of life is griefless and full of bliss, how has it come to be this mixed life that we know, which seems to thrive on the opposites of pleasure and pain. And he showed us how in the very beginning of things, and the, the earth was a purely material creation, sea and sky and stone. Those young gods who were imprisoned in that material uh, form were yearning for something else, the possibility of sensation, of emotion, of delight. And in answer to that intense aspiration, uh, the life goddess poured all her beauty and her bliss down on this material creation, hoping to fill a fair new world with joy. And she did succeed in bringing the life principle into matter, but it was swallowed up by the dark inertia of matter and death. This seems to be a recurrent process in evolution. There's an established level, within it arises an, in, an aspiration of increasing intensity for something more, vaster, truer, brighter, and in response to the aspiration, a higher principle comes down. We will see this happening again. And so in this case, it's the principle of life coming down into matter and getting swallowed up. The mother has explained to Huta how on uh, February 29th, 1956, after the meditation in the playground during the concentration, she had this vision of herself standing in front of a vast golden door and she was told the time has come and she lifted up a huge hammer and struck the door and the door opened and all the supramental forces poured out and poured down like a great golden river and she saw them being swallowed up into dark blue waves of unconsciousness. But she said, but it is there now. Now that power is there in matter and it will evolve. A new world is born. She was quite sure about it. So a similar process has happened with life. And in Canto 4, um, Shobindo showed us um, three levels of this emerging life. Life very, very much involved in matter, emerging with difficulty in the form of tiny, short-lived beings who were there for a moment and gone again. But then, uh, Gradually, the life power got more established, more able to express itself in material forms, and he showed us the animal creation developing mm -hmm. in its many, many different forms. And at the end of Canto IV, we saw the first emergence of some kind of physical mind. He didn't, uh, he didn't at that point uh, lead us towards the higher <coughs> levels of mind. That will happen. We will come to it later. Instead, as he showed us Asvapati wanting to find out about the powers that are behind this life force. And so we read about the, the kingdoms and the godheads of the little mind, the godheads, all the little beings 
invisible to us who are manipulating the life forms. And having seen that, he moved on to the kingdoms of the greater life. That's a much more developed expression of the higher possibilities of life, reaches almost divine levels. And that realm, he says, inspires us with our greater hopes, our ideals, our higher creativity. But after exploring all that and all these higher possibilities of life, King Aswapati realized that this is a closed sphere. There doesn't seem to be any escape from this repetitive pattern of the, all the, despite all the variety of life, uh, it's repetitive, there's something limited, that newness. And above all, what he was searching for is the power which can really make life on earth a divine life. That was missing altogether. So he is guided to go back to the very roots of life and find out where this uh, distortion has come in. For that, he undertakes this descent into the night. So that's where we are reading now. We are on page 205, no, yes, 205 at the break. I, I maybe read a passage just from um, page 204. I'm starting to read on line 76. Life looked at him with changed and somber eyes. Her beauty he saw and the yearning heart in things that with a little happiness is content, answering to a small ray of truth. Or love. He saw her gold sunlight and her far blue sky, her green of leaves and hue and scent of flowers and the charm of children and the love of friends and the beauty of women and kindly hearts of men, but saw too the dreadful powers that drive her moods and the anguish she has strewn upon her ways. Fate waiting on the unseen steps of men and her evil and sorrow and last gift of death. He wants to discover why it is like this. And so he's going down into the dark depths. Funny, would you read? Page 205 at the break. As from a womb obscure. As from a womb obscure, he so emerged the body and visage of a dark unseen, hidden behind the fair outside of life. Its dangerous commerce is our suffering scope. Its rest is a subtle voice in men's heart. All evil starts from that ambiguous space, a fair life to come there. The world grew full of man menacing energy, and wherever turns for help or hope, his eyes, he Field and house, in street and cabin and mart. He met the troll and still still kept come and go down this quieting, broadly influences. A march of brothers figures dark and made along the air with grandiose arms. A falling footstep drew invisible leaves. Shapes that were threats invaded the dream life, and ominous things passed him on the road. Whose very days was a calamity, a charming, sweetness, subtle and formidable, faces that raised as a little and I approached him armed with beauty like a snare, but hid a battle of meaning in each line and could in a moment dangerously change. But he alone returned to that screen the fact a veil upon the inner vision lay. A force was there 
que As Swapati is experiencing this in the inner worlds, in the inner subtle worlds, but there are times and places when these armed, disquieting influences uh, take control of our outer world. Dreadful things happen. All dreadful periods of history are dominated by these dark forces from behind. And human beings don't see, they don't know where this is coming from. Only perhaps a few people may have dreams or visions that give an, an indication of something, but they feel powerless to, uh, to do anything about it. These are such, such strong powers, hidden behind the fair outsides of life. At first we don't notice them, but if their influence persists, then even the outer expressions of life have become terrifying. Beings passed him on the road whose very gaze was a calamity. This may happen to people. They talk about the evil eye, no? Well, I think all of this is very sad. It depresses me. It's extremely depressing. Yes. We read about this um, sardonic rictus on God's face. No, have we read about that yet? What we, you, the lines that you showed this morning. No? And uh, there's a very poignant passage in the agenda when the mother explains about the effect that this passage, these passages had on her. No? How, how disturbing it was. And she has made that drawing, that terrible drawing, and underneath she has written, falsehood is the suffering of the Lord. And then she has said she realized when she saw that, when she experienced that, that the cure must be joy. If we can cling to the divine joy and feel that, it can change it. it the d divine joy and love are the only powers that are strong enough to combat this evil at the root of life. Here we are blessed by their protection. We can always call on that. It is, uh, it is with us all the time. It's protecting us from these dreadful experiences. But there are times and places on the earth when these forces predominate. And what Aspapati was looking for is the power which can change all that, can make, uh, can just dispel all this so that the earth no longer has to suffer in this way, that human beings no longer have to suffer these dark illnesses. Isn't that our choice? It depends, of course, on our choice. But our choice is not always enough. We need, the di we need the divine power and grace. Sometimes, uh, while keeping the inner choice, all we can do is keep quiet and out of notice, <laughs> uh, inconspicuous, quietly endure until the, force, the balance of forces change. So that's when we can call for protection of Shrelbindo and the Mother. Is this passage clear? Would anybody like to ask anything? Is duality essential to this level? Yes. Or it, I can't say it's essential, but it's established you know, at our present state of evolution. There's this, uh, at, on the life level, there's this predominance of duality and thus of the possibility of error, falsehood, suffering, evil even. You know? And there seem to be beings in the subtle worlds who delight in all that. And if they can get hold of human beings and play with them and get them on their side, um, sometimes a whole country or a whole civilization is afflicted with their influence. So it's something Sri Aurobindo is telling us about this so that we can be on our guard against those influences, aware of them, and ask for protection. Mm -hmm. 
I think more than thought, of course it affects the thought, but more than thought is a feeling. Feeling. This is on the, the vital level, the life level. Of course the thought affected and then the actions. And people are, are blind, no? A veil upon the inner vision, not only the outer vision, the inner vision lay. A force was there that hid its dreadful steps. All were beset. Everybody was under attack. But nobody knew anything about that. They didn't realize that they're under attack and that they have to be protecting themselves because nobody could see the source, the authors of their fall. That, that's what Aswapati sees. That this in, in that world, that influence is there everywhere on that level of life which he's entering now. He's only just beginning to enter it. It gets worse and worse. Sorry? Of course, that's what I'm saying, that it has its effect. I was born into a world which was under the threat of fascism. And I remember as a small child being very aware of this dark pressure. It's, uh, it's, it's an atmosphere which I was born into and I was aware of it and I recognize it when I see it or when I experience it. Maybe others <laughs> here are of a similar age. And then we can see that really it's only the divine grace that can save us. Sri Aurobindo put all his force against saving the, the earth from this terrible menace. What he's writing about here, he knows about in detail because he's had to battle it. So let's read on Varadarajan. Would you read, please? Line 148. <laughs> For long. It was an Oman man, an Oman man of India, just closer to live to the one fold, the borderland between the world and there, and the reality was made as well. It was a space where nothing could be true, where nothing was what it had claimed to be, a high appearance that this species was, just nothing would come to us, to one of them. He would be himself in the ending of his life. Thank you. Where is this strength coming from? As for parties aware of some dark wisdom still withheld, he's not able to discern it. But that is the seal and warrant of this strength. There's something, some power behind. So he wants to trace that back to its origin. He followed the track of dim, tremendous steps returning to the night from which they came. So then he comes into this no man's land. It's not ruled by any particular power. Anybody can enter there, but nobody can stay there for long. A borderland between the world and hell, the home of evil. Unreality is the lord of nature there. It was a space where nothing could be true, for nothing was what it had claimed to be. A high appearance wrapped a specious void. <coughs> specious means misleading, an emptiness actually. Yet nothing would confess its own pretense even to itself. So there's a basic insincerity ruling there. A vast deception was the law of things. Only by that deception they could live. Will you read, please? Yo. Only by the deception an unsubstantial meaning granted the falsehood of the form of this nature too, and made them seem a while to, to be and lie. Live. The borrowed magic drew them from the void. They took a shape and stuff that was not there and showed the color that they could not keep heroes to a phantom that can see. Phantasm, you can't see. <laughs> I 
Would you like Eugen to go on? Mirrors to a phantasm of reality. Yes, Eugen. Uh, each rainbow brilliance was a splendid light, the beauty unreal grace, the glamour of things. Nothing could be relied on to remove. Joy virtued tears and good and evil crew, but never all of evil one plucked good. Love ended early in hate, delight killed with pain. Truth into falsity grew and death grew blind. A power that laughed at the mischiefs of the world. Irony that joined the world's control and flung them into each other's arms to strive, put a sardonic witness on their steps. Aloof, its into entered everywhere and left a clothing book marked on the breast, a twisted heart and a strange somber smile, mocked at the sinister comedy of life. Thank you. So there's a power that's enjoying all this, power that laughed at the mischiefs of the world, an irony. Irony is a kind of a contradictory, paradoxical humor. So it's as if there's a, a sense of irony that has taken all the world's contraries, all its opposites, brought them together just to make, to enjoy seeing them fight flung them into each other's arms to strive. So it's as if the, the face of God, the face of the, the ruler, the Lord, <clears throat> has put on <clears throat> this terrible sardonic smile, a smile that is not a smile. A rictus is, is just a spasm of the muscles of the face, no? and this rictus puts such an ugly expression, mocking at all the suffering, all the contradictions, all the mischief. Hmm? Yes, yes. Why? Well, how could it be allowed to be? Yes. He needs our help to prevent it. In this evolutionary world, all we souls have come to be part of this adventure of inconscious, consciousness, unconsciousness, the soul forgetting who and what it is, and slowly climbing up the, the ladder, the golden ladder, back to full consciousness. And on the way, it has to pass through this stage. There's a very interesting chapter in the Life Divine where Sri Aurobindo deals with this, the origin and remedy of a evil, falsehood, suffering. And it seems that it is a necessary part of our soul's evolution to have to face these dark realities. At least it's like that now, until humanity as a whole reaches a level of consciousness that just will no longer allow all this to happen. And so all the great messengers who come, they're trying to give us this warning and this strength and this protection. And if we're willing to collaborate with them, then we get the protection and the strength. But it may be necessary for the soul to go through this ordeal. As we see in Savitri, huh? that she is born to save, and yet because of the state of humanity, this ordeal is imposed on her. She has to suffer the human lot and face grief and evil and suffering on her road. So Mother says, yes, a God who would deliberately do that to us, she can't believe in him. No, she can't. Uh, <laughs> she has no, no respect for such a being no, who would deliberately do it. Sri says we have to remember who is it in us? who is experiencing all. It's the traveler in time. It's the Lord himself in human form who passes through all this. And only his strength can bear it, really. It's not an explanation. Anyway, Aswapati is deliberately going through these experiences to find out what is the, the power, what is the principle that can change it. And he does find it out uh, at the end of Canto 8, but that's quite a few pages ahead, quite a few Sundays. Hmm. It, yes, it's in the end of Canto 8. I'm, I'm not going to jump ahead and uh, 
um, uh, read it, but it's on page 231, line 411. He saw the secret key of nature's change. Here it speaks of a dark wisdom, no? Oh, sorry, I've lost the page now. Here, page 206. He's aware of some dark, a dark wisdom, that is the seal and warrant, which puts the sanction on this strength. So he refers to this power several times at the end of Canto 3, for example, page 130. This is about the fall of life line 518 the secret will that robes itself with night and offers to spirit the ordeal of the flesh imposed a mystic mask of death and pain and there's a passage in canto 2 Hmm, sorry yes on page 17 line 219 or oh, a little higher, 215. This is uh, about the one who's dealing with Savitri. One dealt with her who meets the burdened great, assigner of the ordeal and the path who chooses in this holocaust of the soul, death, fall, and sorrow as the spirit's goads the dubious Godhead with his torch of pain lit up the chasm of the unfinished world and called her to fill with her vast self the abyss. August and pitiless in his calm outlook, heightening the eternal's dreadful strategy, he measured the difficulty with the might and dug more deep the gulf that all must cross. Assailing her divinest elements, he made her heart kin to the striving human heart and forced her strength to its appointed road. She has come to wrestle with the shadow and he has made it more difficult for her. In a way, we all have to wrestle with the shadow at some point in our lives. So Amar Kiran asked Sri Aurobindo, who is this power? Who is this one who assigns the ordeal and the power? And he made several suggestions. No, is it love? Is it pain? Is it time? Uh, who is it? Sri Aurobindo said, I deliver deliberately haven't put any label on it. But you can call him the Lord of Evolution, if you like. It's this opposition which brings our inner strength and forces us to find the way out, which is only up. There's no other way out. One has to go up. So Mother has told a similar story about the, the paradise, the Garden of Eden. No, there's this serpent there who comes and spoils everything, gives Eve the apple and so on. And she says, some people say this is the force of evolution, no, this <coughs> multicolored serpent driving things always onward and upward. So uh, we, we also, we have to pass through this ordeal. No? We've chosen to read Savitri and uh, we have to go through this. When it came to making the paintings, uh, mother told Huta, she said, I've been through this world and I've faced all these difficulties and I don't want to make any images to show to people. So there are no paintings of Canto 8, but of Canto 7 there are still some. <laughs> Irony can be used in quite a, a good way also to, to make contradictions clear. Shobindo occasionally uses irony as part of his humorous um, armory. But yes, here, here it is negative. Yeah, yeah. It's just mean. Yes. I was surprised by the painting of that terrible mask. Uh, it hmm. seems such a sad looking face and not hmm. kind of uh, a mocking 
No. No, she said that is the image that she saw. And then what she wrote, she has herself written underneath. Falsehood is the sorrow of the Lord. It appears in the English dictionary. Yeah, it appears in the English dictionary. It's delight in damage, no? I think everybody has that experience. Mm -hmm. Of seeing bad things happening and thinking, oh good, they got their just desserts, no? Something like that. Yeah. But when you see it in this context, yeah. uh, oh, sorry, <coughs> it's quite shocking. Yeah. But uh, don't you think Julie Beats, uh, you're telling me, I've said it, but you still show up again, to make it just again. No, it can be mean also, sardonic. Oh, you think life is beautiful, you should know better. Sardonic. It's a, I think there was a, um, a school of Greek philosophers, no? Or the cynics. Yeah. Mm. So let's go on a little further. So we, are, um, we stopped at mocked at the sinister comedy of life. A twisted heart and a strange somber smile mocked at the sinister comedy of life. Um, Mi Hong, would you read on, please? Announcing the advent of a perilous form, an ominous trade softened the style of football, football that none might understand or be on guard, none heard until a dreadful grass was closed, or else all augured a divine approach, an air of purpose a heavenly hope, listen for a gospel, watch the rose star, pink was visible but cloaked in light. He seemed a helping angel from the skies, he armed a truth with the scripture and the, the law, he deceived with the wisdom, with the virtue slew the soul, prediction, prediction, by the heavenward path, a lavish sense, he gave up of power and joy. And when arose the warning from within, he reassured the ear with the dulcet tones, or took the mind captive in its own net. His rigorous logic made the force seem true. Amazing elect with the holy law. He spoke unto with the very voice of God. Hmm, let's pause there. He armed untruth with scripture and the law. So these things have happened in human history. But this is all the work of subtle powers, dark power, and they act in such a way that uh, human beings can't be aware. And it may happen that there's this appearance which gives a great hope. Everything augurs, everything points to a divine approach. There's an air of prophecy is felt, a heavenly hope. Oh, at last, everything is going to be set right. People are listening for a gospel, watching for a new star. The fiend, the devil, is there. He's visible, but he's cloaked in light. He seemed a helping angel from the sky. And then he gives all these specious words. He armed untruth with scripture and the law. Capital S and capital L. He deceived with wisdom, with virtue, slew the soul, destroyed the soul and led to perdition, to damnation, by the heavenward path. People think they're on the road to heaven. He's leading them down. He gives a lavish sense of power and joy. Oh, wonderful, we are on the right side. No? And when the warning comes from the soul within, he, that dark power reassures the ear with dulcet tone, sweet musical tone or he catches the mind in its own net with his rigorous logic which makes the false seem true. He bewilders the elect, the chosen ones, or the ones who believe that they are the chosen ones. No? He repeats to them the holy law, the holy learning, the words from the Bible. He makes himself sound like the very mouthpiece 
of God. In that way, it's easy for him to mislead. This is a world of falsehood. Pray for protection. Nothing else to be done. Rely on the divine grace. But the important thing is to know that you're under attack. Hmm? The soul will give you the warning, then you have to listen to it. Yes. I think we talked about it the other day, no? If you're so proud of your virtue. <laughs> well, of course, there's this problem with the duality. You know, if we make this duality between virtue and sin, we can get caught in that net. Yes. The first necessity is to find out who you really are beyond all the appearances. That's what Mother has told us, no? that our center, she says, there's this being, our true being, who should become the acting center of our life. And then we'll hear the warning, warning voice if it comes, and there'll, there'll be a wonderful protection and a guidance, very precise guidance. One has to be so careful. In, in some stories, in some analogies, it's, it's spoken of as following a, a silver thread. You know, like Theseus in the labyrinth, he had to hold on to the thread and find the way out. It's like that. You can't go an inch this way or that way. You just have to follow that thread exactly where it's leading you, and it will bring you out. But first you have to find it, you know, the, the golden key. So all the help is there for everybody who sincerely undertakes that, that search. And some of the help may involve ordeals that you have to pass through. <laughs> Theseus, the story of Theseus and the labyrinth, the, the, the king of Crete, King Minos, he had this monster, uh, uh, a huge, uh, it was a bull with the face of a human being, the Minotaur. Yeah. And of course there's a whole, like these ancient stories, there's a whole chain of stories that goes before it. How, how come he had this Minotaur to deal with? Anyway, he called a great engineer, who is mentioned several times in the poem, Didalus, to design a labyrinth. So the, the Minotaur was inside and couldn't find his way out. And if he wanted to get rid of anybody, he, uh, the king would put them in there with the Minotaur so that they couldn't find their way out. But uh, the king's daughter saw Theseus and was sorry for him, so she gave him a thread that he could fastened to a rock before he went in and then he could go in and he slew, he killed the Minotaur and then he could find his way out following the thread. It comes in some fairy stories also. Having this magic thread that shows you the way. Ariadne. And then he just abandoned her. She'd saved him. <laughs> he carried her off to a desert island and left her there. <laughs> so the Greeks knew all kinds of things. No? So we stopped at, he spoke as with the very voice of God, uh, Paula. The air was full of treachery and ruse. Truth speaking was a stratagem in that place. Ambush lurked in a smile, and peril made safety its cover, trust its entry gate. Falsehood came laughing with the eyes of truth. Each friend might turn an enemy or spy. The hand one clasped and sleeved a dagger's stab, and an embrace could be doom's iron cage. Agony and danger stalked their trembling prey and softly spoke as to a timid friend. Attack sprang suddenly, vehement and unseen. Fear leaped upon the heart at every turn and cried out with an anguish dreadful voice. It called for one to save, but none came near. All warily walked for death was ever close. Yet caution seemed a vain expense of care, for all that guarded proved a deadly night. And when 
after long suspense, salvation came and brought a glad relief, disarming strength. It served as a smiling passage to worse fate. There was no truce and no safe place to rest. One dared not slumber or put off one's arms in a world of battle and surprise. All who were there lived for themselves alone. All warred against all, but with a common hate turned on the mind that sought some higher good. Truth was exiled lest she should dare to speak and hurt the heart of darkness with her light, or bring her pride of knowledge to blaspheme the settled anarchy of established things. Thank you. So I think we've got the picture. Anybody got anything special they would like to ask? I think we could read the next section. We stopped our reading there, no? Yes, so we could just continue reading. Hmm? <clears throat> Patty, would you go after the break? Hmm? Then the scene changed, but kept its dreadful form. Altering its form, the life remained the same. A capital was there without a state. It had no ruler, only groups that strove. She saw a city of ancient ignorance, founded upon a soil that knew not light. There, each in his own darkness, walked alone. Only they agreed to differ in evil's paths, to live in their own way for their own selves, or to enforce a common lie and wrong. Their ego was lowered upon his peacock's seat, and falsehood set by him, his mate and queen. The world turned to them as heaven to truth and God. Injustice, justified by firm decrees, the sovereign weights of errors legalized trade, but all the weights were false and none the same. Ever she watched with her balance and the sword, lest any sacrilegious word expose the sanctified formulas of her old misrule. In high professions, wrath, self-will, walk wide, and license, stop, prating of order and right. There was no altar raised to liberty. True freedom was abhorred and hunted down. Harmony and tolerance nowhere could be seen. Each group proclaimed its dire and naked law. Mm, thank you. Do you like to read? Do you like yes, to read? Um, A frame of frame ethics. A frame of ethics and law with uh, spiritual uh, rules. On a theory passionately <laughs> believed and praised, a table scene of high heaven's sacred code, a formal practice mail and iron shop, gave to a rule and ruthless warrior kind, drawn from the savage boroughs of the earth, proud stern voice of harsh nobility, a civic posture rigid and formidable, but all their private acts beneath the post. Uh, power and utility were their like truth and right. An evil rapacity clothed in covers of good. Peace, pickled, and talents tore all the weaker prey. In their sweet secrecy of pleasant sins, nature they obeyed, and not a moralist god. Inconscient traitors, in bundles of contrar contraries, they did what in others they would. Uh, persecute. With their eyes looked upon their uh, fellow vice and in indignation. indignation flamed a virtuous wrath, oblivious of their own uh, deep hit offense, mob like they stoned uh, a neighbor caught in sin. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Aran. Hmm? You're passing? Uh, Turia. Okay, Manoa. A pragmatist judge within past four degrees. Posted was in this on equity by this day. Equity. Equity space. Reason in actions just sanctioned the scale of the merchant ego's interest and desire. 
Thus, global balance kept. The world could be a zero to push their ruthless stance. All fate, not theirs, bled, scourged as heresy. They questioned, captive, tortured, burned, or smoked, and forced the soul to abandon life or die. Amid her clashing creeds of warring sects, religion sat upon a blood stained throne. A hundred tyrants oppressed and slew and founded unity upon drought and force. Only what seemed was Christ as real there. The idea was a cynic, ridiculous, but hooted by the crowd, mocked by enlightened wits. Spiritual seeking wandered outcast. A dreamer's self deceiving web of thought, or mad chimera deemed our hypocrite's tale, its passionate instinct trained through minds obscure, lost in the circuits of the ignorance. A lie was there, the truth and truth a lie. Mm, thank you. Jerry? Here, as a traveler of the upper grave, for there the hills, kingdoms, winds, winds, winds the heavenly wood, was or passed slowly to the perilous space. Prayer upon his lips and the great name, if those of all the servants keen spear great, he might stumble to falsities and his net. Over his shoulder, often he must look back like one who feels on his neck an enemy's breath, else stealing up behind a treacherous blow, might for state cast and pin to unholy sorrow, pierced to his neck a evil's frightened state. So might I fall on the eternal road, forfeiting the spirit's lonely chance in time. And no news of him which the waiting gods marked, missing in the register of souls. His name indexed on a failing hope, the position of a dead remembered star. Only you have safe and kept God to their hearts, courage, their armor, faith, their sword, they must walk. They had ready to smite the eye to scout, casting a gentle regard in front, heroes and shoulders, the army of light. Hardly even so, the grisly danger past, released to a calm of pure air. They dared at length to breathe and smile once more. Once more, they will release a reason. So help make move, the spirit still can power. This no man's land is to past without the day. Then the heights miss it, then the abyss desired. None stood across his way, no voice for day. For swift and easy is the family path that now was denied, was turned to his face. Hmm. We've got three more sections.